Welcome to worship. I'm Pastor Hans. I'm glad you're here for Martin Luther Lutheran Church. We are here as the church together. A few quick announcements as before we start service today, we will have communion at the end of service. So if you have your communion elements ready, get them out. We're going to have communion today. It's going to be fantastic. We'll be joining for worship. At the end, we'll be having, I teased this out last week, uh, we'll be having the explanation and sharing of our vision statement. So that is coming up at the end of service as well during the announcement. So stick around. You want to hear that. It's really exciting. I'm so thrilled for this. But before we get there, we turn to worship now. So let's pray together, sing together, hear the readings together. Let's turn our hearts and worship God together now. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us confess our sins in the presence of God and one another. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake God forgives us all our sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Earth and world stars, love rushing planets, sing to the Lord a new song. Hail wind and rain, love blowing snow.
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all, and also with you. Let us pray. Sovereign God, ruler of all hearts, you call us to obey you, and you favor us with true freedom. Keep us faithful to the ways of your Son, that leaving behind all that hinders us, we may steadfastly follow your paths through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. What's in Pastor's bag? Yeah, what's in Pastor's bag? What's in Pastor's bag? Yeah, what's in Pastor's bag? I don't know what's in there. What's in Pastor's bag? Bum bum. Hi, I'm Pastor Hans. I'm Go Pastor Ross. Take a feel, see what's in there today. Mm. It's a paper product of some kind. And you see me get out of a certain box? Oh, those cheap Arby's, those cheap Arby's paper airplanes. <laughs> cheap Arby's, no, no. But this is the rule book for Risk. Risk, one of my favorite games to play. I know how to take risks. <laughs> yes, <laughs> but we're talking about the game Risk. And this oh. is a booklet. And what does the booklet explain, Wes? Does it explain how to play the game of chess? Um, it makes sense because chess has a lot of risk in it. No, like, different games! Oh. Does this explain how you apply to get your driver's license? Yes, sir! Oh, wait, no. No, it's not because... Oh, no, that's capital one. <laughs> so, what does this rule book explain? Um, risk. Risk? This rule book is to explain the game risk. And there's certain rules to it. I will say... In high school, my buddies and I would play Risk, and we actually had our own rules for Risk. And I typed them out, and those about like 12 pages long. But I can this is a great rule book because it tells you how to play the game, right? Yeah. Now, of course, like some of the more complex games have bigger rule books. So. This one's not that bad, but it's oh, definitely yeah. probably like, how many pages is it? Like, oh, look, 19 pages. So that's a sizable rule book. So the rules are helpful for playing the game, right? Mm-hmm. What about the rule book in our society? Um, there's laws. There's laws. And what are laws, are, what are they for? Um, Sticky. there one thing, and it kind of failed it. Determining if something is morally right or morally wrong. The laws do help keep us in check, huh? And so, we are thankful for laws because they keep orderly society and right or wrong to some degree. Yeah. But there are some laws that some things are not against the law, but they're just kind of weird. Like driving 10 miles under the speed limit with 20 pounds of mayonnaise in the back seat. I've got, I know another one. What is that? If someone steals from you, steal your property back. I mean, it sounds illegal. Yeah, but in the end, it's not morally wrong at all. So do two wrongs make a right? Um, mm. In terms of grammar, yes. Okay, let's go with double negative. Okay, so the rules in our society to keep us safe and to keep society orderly, right? Yeah. So we're we going to learn about rules yeah. later. We do not want to recreate the Bronze Age collapse. Certainly not. So the rules and our laws and like a game are there for society. But here's the thing. Not everything is in the rule book. So we have to learn about right and wrong. Hmm. Where else can we learn about right and wrong at? The Bible. The Bible. And there's another thing you've got to know. You gotta do your best to try to not abuse the power of like saying like, oh, you can, oh, if you proceed to this certain maneuver by moving these territories to here, you can then invade and capture a certain territory without doing anything. Are you talking like, about the game Risky now? Yeah, like. I thought you were talking about real life invading countries. Oh, no. <laughs> so, okay. So, yeah, so the rules are good for that. So. And there are rules that we learn about in the Bible and vacation Bible school and Sunday school and at service and those good things. So the rules and laws are there for a good reason. But the highest law is the love of God and the love of neighbor. Jesus said it's the greatest law. The greatest law is to love God and love your neighbor. Ooh. That's like one sentence. We don't need a whole rule book. So we got that. Yeah. Harder said than enough. Okay, Ray, let's pray. Dear God. Dear God. You are amazing. You are amazing. You help us live. You help us live. In orderly lives. In orderly lives. In an orderly society. In an orderly society. Help us. Help us. To love you. To love you. And love our neighbor. And love our neighbor. Everything will fall into place. Everything will fall into place. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Bye. Bye.
Bum, bum. The first reading comes to us from Romans chapter 3, verses 21 through 28. But now, irrespective of law, the righteousness of God has been disclosed and is attested by the law and the prophets, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, since all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, they are now justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a sacrifice of atonement by his blood, effective through faith. He did this to show his righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over the sins previously committed. It was to prove at the present time that he himself is righteous and that he justifies the one who has faith in Jesus. Then what becomes of boasting? It is excluded. By what law? By that of works? No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that a person is justified by faith apart from works prescribed by the law. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our psalm is a part of Psalm 119, verses 65 through 72. You have dealt well with your servant, O Lord, according to your word. Teach me good judgment and knowledge, for I believe in your commandments. Before I was humbled, I went astray, but now I keep your word. You are good and do good. Teach me your statutes. The arrogant smear me with lies, but with my whole heart I keep your precepts. Their hearts are fat and gross, but I delight in your law. It is good for me that I was humbled, so that I might learn your statutes. The law of your mouth is better to me than thousands of gold and silver pieces. Our second reading continues in the book of Romans. This one from chapter 7, verses 7 through 13. What then should we say? That the law is sin? By no means. Yet, it, if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said, you shall not covet. But sin, seizing an opportunity in the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. Apart from the law, sin lies dead. I was once alive, apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died, and the very commandment that promised life proved to be death to me. For sin, seizing an opportunity in the commandment, deceived me, and through it, killed me. So the law is holy, and the commandment is holy, and just and good. Did what is good, then, bring death to me? By no means. It was sin, working death in me, through what is good, in order that sin might be shown to be sin, and through the commandment might become sinful beyond measure. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, alleluia, give thanks to the risen Lord. Alleluia, alleluia, give praise to His name. Jesus is Lord. Hallelujah, 
Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Matthew, the 22nd chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. And when the crowd heard it, they were astounded at his teaching. When the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? He said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. I'm sure many of you have seen the ad this week for a local Missouri politician who's running to be the U.S. Senator for our state of Missouri. Uh, he's a Republican and the video is quite odd as a campaign ad. It shows him with what looks like tactical guys, looks like supposed to be a SWAT team, breaking into a house, threatening a grenade and with a shotgun and announcing that he's going to rhino hunting. And he encourages the Republican base to get the rhino permit to hunt up and hunt down all the rhinos and so you might be thinking they're not rhinoceros here in missouri no rhino is a different term r-i-n-o it means republican in name only this term has been used derogatory by many people within the republican party for those they disagree with for those who they think are moderate or willing to actually work with the democrats heaven forbid or people who are actually not completely in the party line now, obviously, this campaign ad is controversial, it's disturbing, it's bizarre, uh, because there's too much gun violence already in our society. And the idea of hunting people in your own political party does not settle well. The idea of hunting and rounding up and hunting down these people because they're not agreeing with you is a little concerning for any political party. But this term has been used for many years. It's a way to distinguish who's in and who's out who is a good Republican inside and who's a bad Republican, who is a rhino and should be on the outside of the group. 
This is something that's interesting because it's a, a line of demarcation, it's a boundary line. And these lines are artificial. They're created by people, and usually they're created by people who think they're on the inside group. Who is in and who's out? This is a question we can ask ourselves of church, political parties, even families. Who do we not talk to? Who, What family members do we feel are on the outskirts that have left the family? Who in our society do we not include? Who in our society do we leave out? This question of who's the in-group and who's the out-group is something we should always be asking ourselves. And especially as a church, do we welcome everybody? Do we welcome the doors and do we open the doors and say, yes, come on in. We want you in here. We welcome everybody. Or do we say, no, you're in the out-group. Mm, you're not one of us. Or yeah, you're part of us. You are a child of God. You're in the in-group. In Judaism, the classic line of this in-group, out-group dynamic was the law. When we say the law, it you might think of like one law, one single thing, but it's really the collection of all the Old Testament laws. These are the customs and traditions that were handed down from Moses, from God, to the people of Israel. They celebrate the law on Pentecost. They celebrate the law by how they live. Now, when Judaism was really spread across the world, across the known world of the time, from Babylon to Egypt, all the way out to India and over to Rome, the diaspora, the diaspora of Jews around the world, the only thing that really kept them united, they kept all faithful Jews together, was the law. And the law was really a thing about who's in and who's out. Because Jewish laws were different than other cultures. They were different than other religions. They were really all-encompassing. What you ate, what you drank, where you lived, what clothing you wore, how you, you know, planted fields, how you planted crops. All these things were included in the law the Jewish custom, the Jewish traditions. And from the law, the interpretation of them grew and grew and grew. And Jesus had some of these conflicts with other fellow Jews. And they would call Jesus out on this. They say, well, you're not following the traditions and customs. And Jesus says, you're adding to the law. You're adding stuff that was not there to begin with. This is a conflict for Christians and Jews in the early centuries, especially from the time of Jesus onward of who's in and who's out. The Jewish law gave a very clear distinction. You follow the law or you don't. You're in or you're out. You're one of us or you're not. And so this really became a big thing. The law became a larger than life thing. The law became a way to signify who was in the community and who was the community and who was not. Now for Paul, when he's writing in Romans and we're in the series on the book of Romans this summer, the law becomes a big thing because it's a big thing for Judaism. It's a big thing that he grew up with. He defended the law. He upheld the law. He lived by every one of the 613 laws of the Old Testament. He was faithful. But when push comes to shove and it becomes a matter of, do you follow the law or do you follow Jesus? Do you follow the spirit of God or the letter of the law? Now, Paul is obviously throughout the book of Romans, this becomes a big deal. And clearly Paul says, you follow Christ. We as Christians follow after the Son of God, the risen one. We follow after the Spirit of God after Pentecost. We don't follow the law of the Old Testament anymore because that's not what we were made for. The law was given to the Old Testament, to the people, to the Israelites and Hebrews. It was given for a very good reason. It was given for a purpose. They were the chosen people of the time. But now Christians are not bound by that law because they now have the Word of God incarnate. As the Gospel of John says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word of God is no longer the law. The Word of God is now Jesus. The Word of God is now the doctrine of the incarnation. Christ our Lord is the law, the Word of God in the flesh. And so Paul really talks about this at length. The law really becomes this synonymous theme for Judaism of do we follow the strictness of Judaism or are we following Christ? And this is a major theme throughout the book of Romans. And it also is a major theme in the book of Hebrews, book of Galatians, book of Colossians. This is a major theme for early Christians because they're really trying to figure out who are we? Are we part of this in-group of Judaism or are we outside Judaism? Or are we the fulfillment of Judaism? This is a wrestling that the early church really does. And for Paul writing the book of Romans, it's a major theme. And so we hear about the law over and over again. And so we heard just two snippets of the law. 
again, the law for the Jewish people was this beautiful thing. They loved it. They celebrated it. It was this wonderful thing. It was not just, you know, the U.S. Constitution or the legal code for the state of Missouri. No, this was a beautiful thing. We heard in our psalm today, Psalm 119, where it says the words of your law of your mouth is more beautiful to me than a thousand pieces of gold and silver. The longest chapter of the Bible, Psalm 119, we heard today, we heard a small snip of it. It's the longest chapter of the Bible, and it's a poem, an acrostic poem, beautifully written about the law of God. I would not write a beautiful long chapter of poetry about the laws of God. That's not something I would normally think of, but that's there. In the book of Psalms, in the longest chapter in the entire Bible, is a beautiful poem about the law of God. Jewish people loved it. And Paul is doing something radically different. Paul is saying, we don't need it. We don't live by it. We're not corralled by it. We are not contained by it. And so the question really becomes one of what good is the law anymore? Why have the Old Testament? This is a debate that early church had and Christians had as they struggle with this. And the solution was we need the Old Testament. We need those laws, but we're not bound by them anymore. And so a key thing of Lutheranism it actually explains this. Uh, this is a major theological point of Lutheranism. Many Lutherans never heard growing up. So if you've never heard this, I'm sorry, but you're going to hear it today. It's called the three uses of the law or the third use of the law. And so Martin Luther derives a lot from the book of Romans we're studying. What good is law? So the first use of the law is civil order. We talk about this as a curb of our baser instincts. We talk about this as the civil order in our society. We have laws like speed limits and laws about building codes, laws about food safety, laws about weapon use. We have laws about murder and you know violence and assault. We have all kinds of laws in our society. And the laws in our society today, the first use of them is for civil order. So the first use of the law is a curb. It helps keep civil order and it curbs our baser instinct. It curbs our sinful inclinations. Our civil order and civil code of laws keep society nice and orderly and friendly. That's the first use of the law. And we hear a lot about that. This is how we live in our society today. You are hear a lot about laws with the Supreme Court decisions coming out the last week and the few weeks coming up here. The second use of the law is that the law shows us from the Old Testament that we are sinful. We actually heard that today in Paul's talking about this. He said, if it wasn't for the law, I would not have known what sin was. Now, some people might look at that and go, huh? Don't you know right and wrong on your own? Well, Paul's point is saying that the law really instructed the people on what the law is and the fact that we break the law, one of the 613 laws, we break these laws. And so therefore we're a sinner. Even the Ten Commandments. It's not easy to keep all the Ten Commandments all the time. We might be tempted by to break one of them, whether it be through anger or greed, or lying, or unfaithfulness, or any of these things, or talking back to your parents. Any of these things of the Ten Commandments could be breaking the law, and so it illustrates to us our struggle and temptation. And so Martin Luther talked about this as the second use of the law is to show us our sin. Paul even talked about that in the book of Romans today we heard. If it wasn't for the law, I would not have even known what sin was. So the law shows us where we struggle. It shows us where we're tempted. It shows us how we fall short of the glory of God. And that's the second use of the law. And sometimes we call that a mirror because it reflects back to us that we are sinners. So we have coming up here, the final one, the third use of the law. The third use of the law is actually the, how do we live as Christians now? The so what? Okay, so you've been saved by grace. So you have been saved by faith. So you have Christ, you have the Holy Spirit, you have the church. Now what? Now how do we live? This is rather daunting. This is probably the most challenging of all the uses of the law because it's rather great. This use of the law requires us to think, to discern, to be empathetic, to live in that grace space, to decide what is right and wrong. And maybe the law doesn't require this or it doesn't say it's outlawed, but maybe I shouldn't do it. Or maybe I'm tempted by this, but I shouldn't be doing this. Or just how do I live as a Christian? And sometimes we call this a guide, like a map. And so this is where really shows us how we should be living. When Jesus was questioned about the law, we heard this in the gospel reading today. They said, oh, what is the greatest commandment? And Jesus said to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and strength. And the second is to love your neighbor yourself. We oftentimes shorten this up of love God and love your neighbor. 
And that's what Jesus said. And they really impressed the scribes because they debate the laws. And they were debating all the time. And Jesus gave a very radical new answer. Love God, love your neighbor. Boom. And that's really the third use of the law. Because if we love God and love our neighbor, then we wouldn't do horrible things. We wouldn't lie and steal and cheat and do those things. We'd actually care for people. We would lift them up. We would help them. And so this third use of the law is like a map. It's a guide that shows us how we are to live now that we are Christians. The law is not this all-encompassing thing that separates us from others. The law is not this wall that keeps us safe from those outsiders. The law is not even how we identify in our culture. Who we are as Christians is not defined by the law. But the law is still useful. We don't get rid of it. We don't cut out the Old Testament. The law is still useful because it has for civil order, the first use of the law, it's a curb. The second use of the law, it is a mirror. It reflects back the fact that we are sinful. And the third use of the law is a map. It helps guide us in how we live today. And so through all three of these, the third use of the law, all of these show us how to live as Christians on different levels because we engage the world in different ways. The law is actually helpful for us today, but we have to know how it is helpful. And that's a core theme of Lutheran theology. This third use of law really helps us live in the world today. We're not bound by the law. We're not instructing this. We're not writing the laws of God on the walls of our buildings, but rather we live by them. A curb, a mirror, a map. These are ways that we live with the law today in Christ first, and then we live that out. So may you live out the law. May you live out the uses of the law, a curb, a mirror, and a map. May you live it out inspired by God, set free in the world of not as much black and white, but a lot of gray and a lot of questions and a lot of thinking discerning. May you live out the third use of the law every day in peace and joy. Amen.
We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death, and was buried. On the third day he rose again, in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us enter into prayer together. United in Christ and guided by the Spirit, we pray for the church, the creation, and all in need. God of faithfulness, set the face of your church firmly on you. Rooted in your self-giving love, may the church find freedom in loving our neighbors. God of grace, hear our prayer. God of gentleness, strengthen the earth's ability to heal. Where there are dangerous storms, bring calm. Where there are destructive fires, bring rain. Protect homes, habitats, and livelihoods threatened by climate disasters. God of grace, Hear our prayer. God of peace, guide all who govern that they place the good of their citizens above self-promotion. Anoint leaders of nations with your spirit of neighborly love. Protect refugees and all who live under tyranny or conflict. God of grace, hear our prayer. God of kindness, 
reveal your healing presence to all who are sick or dying. Uphold those who grieve. Support the needs of any who are unemployed, hungry, or have nowhere to lay their heads. God of grace, hear our prayer. God of joy, we give thanks for all who have died and now celebrate the inheritance of life in you. Keep their examples of faithfulness always before us, that we trust your promises in life and in death. God of grace, hear our prayer. God of every time and place, in Jesus' name and filled with your Holy Spirit, we entrust these spoken prayers and those in our hearts into your holy keeping. Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, maker of all things. Through your goodness you have blessed us with these gifts. With them we offer ourselves to your service and dedicate our lives to the care and redemption of all that you have made. For the sake of him who gave himself for us, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let's give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and joy at all times and all places, to give thanks and praise to you, Almighty Father, through your Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by the glorious resurrection has opened the way of eternal life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join the unending hymn. Holy, mighty, merciful Lord, heaven and earth are full of your glory. In great love you sent to us Jesus, your Son, who reached out to the heal the sick and suffering, who preached good news to the poor, and who on the cross opened his arms to all. In the night in which our Lord Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread, gave thanks, and broke it, giving disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body which is broken for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, blessed it, gave disciples, saying, Take and drink. This cup is a new covenant shed in my blood for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. For as often as we eat of this bread and drink from this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Pour out upon us your spirit of love, O Lord, and unite all who share this heavenly food the body and blood of Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory, now and forever. Amen.
Psalm 139 God of life, you have searched me and know me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from far away. But you did not make me a puppet. You do not control my sitting and rising. You and your goodness do not desire my thoughts to be captive. You search out my path and my laying down. You are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely. You find pleasure in who I am. In you and in me, there is no disgust, shame, or condemnation of your creation. You hem me in, behind and before, and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. This intimacy and security is hard to grasp. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? When I am living my best life, you are there. When I struggle to find meaning or care, you are there. If I take the wings of my wildest imagination and settle at the farthest limits of what love and humanity can be, even there, your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me fast. If I say, I will lie about who I am, even to myself, so you cannot find me. Even my deceit cannot deceive you. You see through all my masks as truth, for all I am is truth to you. For it was you who formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. With her consent and when she willed my body to be carried in hers, You were with her too, not using her, but with her. In her choices, you set your wisdom. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. I know that very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made a mystery. Woven in the depths of earth and water and mother, You, God, beheld the possibility of me. In your book were written all the days that were possible for me when none of them as yet existed. And in goodness you chose my mother to choose when she was able to bring pregnancy to term, to bring possibility into reality, to nurture mystery into child by her own body. The stakes are so high in understanding your wisdom, God. How vast is the sum of knowledge that makes and sustains life? I try to count it. It is like an ending sand in the shore of a vast ocean. I come to the end. I am still with you. Oh, that you would liberate women and children from the power hungry and those willing to kill for power. Who would subjugate your precious creation and children and strip away women's autonomy and the discernment of life, both hers and a child's. Search me, O God. and know my heart. Test me and know my thoughts. Show me what it is to affirm life and justice in the world and lead me in the way of everlasting. Amen.
Thank you for making time to gather to worship today. Thank you for being the people of God, taking this moment to connect with God and connect with the church. We appreciate you tuning in for service today. Now we have a few announcements for you. The first one I teased last week, and I'm excited to share this, is our new vision statement. So we as a council have been working on this, crafting this, working with through ideas, and really we got all the material from you all. So we appreciate your input. We had an online part and we had an in-worship part as well. So we had a list that people could circle and check and do all these things with, and that really gave us material. And also we had the in-person vision mission meetings and all those notes, all the material came and the council went through it, prayerfully considered and digested. We looked at what was the thing that kept coming up, what were the themes of these statements. And so I'm glad to share with you what we've worked on. And so our vision statement for MLC is embracing God's love through welcoming, worshiping, inspiring, and serving together. Now, I would not have written that myself, actually. That's great. And I know that God's working this because it's not what I would first think, but it's really good. What I appreciate about it is it starts with embracing God's love. God loves us even while we're sinners, we hear in the Bible tell us. And so even while sinners, Christ died for us. And so the point is that it starts with God and embracing God's love is the first part, that God's love is already here and we embrace it. Now, we embrace it through welcoming everybody. Everyone who is in here is welcome in the church. We welcome everyone into our community, welcome them all with open arms regardless of where they come from, what we look like, how we dress, how we talk. We welcome everybody. I love that about this church. And the welcoming was a top priority time and time again through all the workshops and surveys and everything we did. Welcoming was the number one thing. The number two thing was worship. This is important because this is what, as the church, we do. You are here, you're watching it, you are worshiping with us. So worship is a crucial thing. Welcoming worship, the two W's started off. And also, wanted to make sure that this is uplifting. The church was encouraging, strengthening, helping people grow in their faith. And so the word that came up that we liked was inspiring. That word came up quite a few times, inspiring. And with that, we don't just live inside the wall of church, but we go out and we serve and we serve together. And all these things are together. So I like that we end with together. So our vision statement is embracing God's love through welcoming, worshiping, inspiring, and serving together. But that's not the end. Kind of like the 30th of the law, what we heard today, the 30th law of the map of how we actually live. So we have our vision statement now, how we're going to live that out. We're going to be talking uh, theology on tap in July and August. We have dates coming up for you for that. We'll be meeting at the Goat Brewery on Wednesday nights during July and August. So you'll have those dates come up and we'll be talking about mission, how we actually live into the vision statement. How do we see that become a reality? How's that map for how we actually live that 30th of the law? So that's coming up here soon. So stay tuned. We got a lot of exciting stuff coming up this summer. We appreciate you being here. We thank you for your support, your prayers, your dedication. We appreciate all that you do for the church and for God. We hope you have a wonderful week. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.